Okay, at this point, you guys should have gone over some of the background of genetics and have a good understanding of some of the basic vocabulary. What we want to start talking about now is how to do some genetics problems, and in particular, we're going to talk about a monohybrid cross. So first, we want to review the rules of genetics problems. Anytime you do any genetics problem, you want to go through these rules in your head. And the first thing you want to do is read through the problem and assign letters to represent the alleles. For example, a problem may tell you that tall is dominant to short. And so in that case, you'd make yourself a little key, and you would use an uppercase letter for the dominant trait, tall, and a lowercase letter for the recessive trait, short. One hint that I'll give to you is to make sure that you use words where the uppercase and the lowercase letters look differently. If you think that your big O and your little O look different, you're going to get really confused once you have a whole Punnett square full of these letters. The next thing that you want to do when you're reading through the problem is write down the parent's genotypes. Remember, genotypes are the alleles that a person has, the letters that they're assigned. So as you read through the problem, maybe it would tell you that one of the parents was homozygous dominant, one of the parents was heterozygous. Maybe the problem tells you that one of the parents is heterozygous and the other is homozygous recessive. Whatever it is, you write it down. And then the third thing you do is solve the problem using a Punnett square. So let's use that first set of parents here, and we'd put one parent on the side, one parent on the top, and we'd fill in our Punnett square. Okay? So you always go through this checklist in your head. First, you make a key, then you show the genotypes of the parents, and then finally you solve with Punnett square. Remember at the end to always go back and figure out what the question's asking. Sometimes they're simply asking you to solve for the Punnett square, fill it in. Other times they're going to ask you the genotypes or the phenotypes of the parents. Let's imagine that in this problem they asked us for the um, genotypes of the parents. So we have here 50% big T, big T, 50% big T, little t. So you always figure out what it's asking you for and circle it. Okay, so always go through these rules in your head. Let's talk about monohybrid crosses. Monohybrid crosses are the simplest type of cross, and you may have seen these before. They always involve one gene where one trait, one allele, is dominant over the other. So we always use an uppercase and a lowercase letter. So here's that example again of the tall versus the short trait. Now in reality, being tall or being short really actually is several genes, probably upwards of 10 genes. And the problem wouldn't be this simplified, but we're going to look at it just one gene at a time as we first start learning the genetics. So let's imagine that tall is dominant over short. This tall person could have two genotypes. They could be homozygous dominant or heterozygous. Either of these results in a tall phenotype. A short person has to be homozygous recessive. That's the only genotype that leads to a short phenotype. Because anyone that has that big T, our key over here tells us, is going to be tall. So let's try some sample problems. We'll go through our steps. In dogs, wire hair is dominant to smooth. So the first thing I do is make a key. Big A, wire, little a, smooth. In a cross of a homozygous wire-haired dog with a smooth-haired dog, all right, I don't read any farther. I just go ahead and I write down my parents. So a homozygous wire hair dog. Homozygous tells me same, and wire hair tells me big A. So big A, big A. Cross with a smooth haired dog. Smooth haired dog I know has to be little A's only. It asks what will be the genotypes and phenotypes of the F1 generation. So the first thing I always do is make my Punnett square. One parent on the side, the other parent on the top. I fill it in, and then I answer the question, the genotypes and the phenotypes of the F1 generation. Well, these are the parents, so these offspring in my Punnett square are my F1 generation. The genotypes are all big A, little a. Now, it's your choice if you want to do a ratio, a percent, or a fraction, because the problem doesn't specify, so I'll just do a percent. 100% big A, little a. And the phenotypes, I look back at my key, these are all going to have wire hair, so 100% wire hair. I have my key, I have my parents, I have my Punnett square, and I circle my answer. If you need to, pause the video and go back and try this problem on your own. Let's try something else. Wood rats are medium-sized rodents with lots of interesting behaviors. You may know them as pack rats. 
Let's assume that the trait of bringing home shiny objects is dominant to the trait of carrying home only dull. So I make my key. Big B, shiny, little b, dull. Suppose two heterozygous individuals are crossed. Heterozygous I know means different. So two heterozygous individuals. They both have the two different alleles. How many of each genotype would be expected if only four offspring were produced? So I fill in my Punnett square. And I have my key, my parents, and my Punnett square. So I have to answer the question. How many of each genotype would be expected if only four offspring were produced? Now it's convenient that this problem is asking us for four offspring because there's four boxes in my Punnett square. And I don't have to do a lot of math here. I know whatever four I see here is what would be expected to see in four offspring. So if I had four offspring, I would expect to see one, big B, big B, two, big B, little b's, and one, little b, little b. Since it's just asking me how many of each genotype, I can stop there. So I circle my answer. Here's our third problem. In mice, black fur is dominant over white fur. Okay, I always stop and make my key. Black fur, white fur. If two mice are crossed and produce all black offspring, list the possible genotypes and phenotypes the parents could have. Well, normally what I would do right now is write down the genotypes of my parents, but that's what this problem is asking me for. So this is what you would call in math class kind of like guess and check. And you can do it in your head, or you can do it by making Punnett squares. But what we're going to do is guess until we can figure out all the different parents that would give us all black offspring. So the first one I'm going to choose is Big B, Big B, Big B, Big B. I know, I can visualize in my head, that that's going to fill in my Punnett square with all Big B, Big B offspring, which will all be black. So I know one combination is Big B, Big B, crossed with Big B, Big B. But I want to find all of the possible combinations. So I'll make another Punnett square, and this time I'll leave one parent as Big B, Big B, but I'll just try out and see what happens if I change one of these to Big B, Little B. So I fill that in, and I find that... Those offspring are also all black. So I'll write that down as a possible combination. All right, what if I made this a little b? Could I have both parents being heterozygous? Well, I realize I can't because this would become little b, little b, and I'd have a white offspring. And I know in my head, I don't have to even fill out a Punnett square to know that I can't have little b, little b, cross with little b, little b, because those would be all white. But what if I had big B, big B, cross with little b, little b. That's kind of the only combination I haven't tried yet. And that also happens to give me all white offspring. So, had to work backwards here. I circle my answer. Those are the parent combinations that would give me all black offspring. Let's try a few more problems. In humans, earlobes are either free or attached. The free earlobe is completely dominant over attached. All right, I'm going to use E's because I know my big E looks different than my little E. Dominant trait is the free earlobe. The recessive trait is the attached earlobe. A man with free earlobes marries a woman with attached. Okay, so the man has free earlobes, and so I know he must have a big E. But the problem hasn't told me yet if he's homozygous dominant or if he's heterozygous. I'm not sure what that other letter is. The woman has attached earlobes, and since that's the recessive trait, I know the woman must be little e, little e. It says, of their four children, one has free earlobes and three have attached. Give the genotype for his man, the man, his wife, and their children. If I were to just leave that blank in the problem, it may help me to visualize what's going on in the Punnett square. I have a blank and a blank. All right, it says that they have four children. One of them has free earlobes, which means that one child has a big E, and three have attached. Now initially I'm looking at my Punnett square. That may appear to not make sense because if some of the children have attached earlobes, I know this must be little e. So I quickly figure out that the father must have been heterozygous. But when I'm looking mathematically, it's not making sense because my Punnett square is telling me I should have two 
pre-earlobes and two attached. The problem says that of their four children, I have one pre-earlobe and three attached. But you know what? That's okay. It's okay that the children actually were born like this. Because if you think about it, if you have a penny and you flip that penny two times, you would expect to get one head and one tail on your flips. But you know in reality, if you flip a penny twice in a row, you might get two heads or two tails. And that's the same thing here. These four options are just the possible offspring that these parents could have. These in reality are what they got. But as long as they show up on the Punnett square, we're okay. It's not what we would have guessed according to probability, but it still is possible children. So the question says, give the genotype for the man, his wife, and their children. So I'll label these man, wife, children. Okay, let's try one last monohybrid cross problem. In humans, having a widow's peak is recessive to a normal hairline. All right, I'll use not P, maybe a D, because my P's wouldn't look different. So having it is recessive to normal. So a normal hairline is dominant. Having it is recessive. Cross a woman who has a straight hairline whose mother had a widow's peak. All right, well, if the woman has a straight hairline, I'm in this situation again where I know she's big D blank. I know she has one big D. I don't know if she's homozygous dominant or heterozygous. But if her mother, if this woman's mother had a widow's peak and her mom was little d, little d, well, you get all your traits from your parents. One of these letters came from her mom and one from her dad. And if her mom only had little d's, we know the woman must have been heterozygous. We're crossing that with a man who's homozygous recessive for the trait. And it asks for the genotypes and phenotypes of the offspring. So what I want you to do right now is pause the video and solve this problem, figure out the genotypes and phenotypes of the offspring, and then come back and watch me finish working it out and make sure we get the same answer. So go ahead and pause it now. Now, when you unpause the video, you should have already solved and figured out what you think the genotypes and the phenotypes are. And here's how I worked that out. I have the one parent on the side of the Punnett square, the other one on the top, and I filled it in. The first thing the problem asks me for, oops, is for the genotype ratios, so I have 50% big D, little d, 50% little d, little d, and then it asks me for the phenotype ratios, which I know is the trait, which in this case is 50% normal, and 50% widow's peak. Circle my answer.